by recognizing Jerusalem and moving our embassy there, uh, our country is saying what we know from history and the Bible that Jerusalem has actually been the capital of Jerusalem for 3,000, or uh, capital Israel. of Israel for 3,000 years. And here's why that is so significant. That historical truth that Jerusalem has been the capital for 3,000 years absolutely explodes the myth that comes from the left that somehow the Jewish people just came into that land 70 years ago and they took it away from the Palestinians and that the Jews have no rightful claim to it. The Bible says and history confirms that God gave that land to the Jewish people and I believe as G Genesis 12 says God blesses those countries that bless Israel and he curses those countries countries that curse Israel. I believe President Trump and the United States are not only on the right side of history in this decision, they're on the right side of God. And here it is, the Balfour Declaration. What do you feel when you, when you see it here? I genuinely feel it's one of the most extraordinary moments in the history of the Jewish people. If you think it took 3,000 years uh, to get to this. And then you say, how did this miracle happen? It's the most incredible piece of opportunism. I mean, if you think you had an impoverished uh, would-be scientist, Heim Weizmann, who somehow gets to England, meets a few people, including members of my family, seduces them, he has such great charm and conviction. He gets to Balfour, and he unbelievably persuades Balfour and Lloyd George, the Prime Minister, and most of the ministers, that this idea of um, the national home for um, Jews should be allowed to take place. I mean, it's so, so unlikely. You come back to the big point, which is that this is perhaps the greatest event in Jewish life for thousands of years. And um, it's a miracle that it took place. Hello and welcome everybody to another session, another study with Jörg Lissmann from Jörg 66 Hour of the Truth and Tom Fress from Inquisition Update. Another study of exploding the Israel deception and today we are doing something that we announced last time. We are going into commentary by Matthew Henry who is one of the most famous Bible commentators. And I say most famous because he is to be found in Esort. That is a program that you can find on the internet for free. I'm going to show it you right here. And when you go to it, you have the possibility to have the explanation of the original Hebrew words in the Old Testament or Greek words in the New Testament. And then you can check the translation and check the understanding. And most and for all, you can see if your Bible is true to the true word of God because this one's based on the King James Bible, but there are so many Bibles out there that just deceive people. Now, next to that, you have the possibility to go, for example, here to F.B. Meyer, who is a commentator, to Matthew Henry, who is a commentator. You can download more commentators on that. And I only download it in the time Matthew Henry, or he even comes with a default. I don't know. I don't remember anymore. And when you just go to one chapter of the Bible and the verses that you want to see the comment about, you click here, like I click now on the word determined, and then it opens up here, Daniel chapter 9, verses 20 through 27. Uh, we are not going through all 20 through 27, and I'm not going to bore you with this kind of small screen. Uh, we are starting here with Romans 3, and I put that in a extra PDF. So everything that is written here down to the end is the comment that Matthew Henry gave of his understanding that he is teaching others, because that's the idea of a comment, that he is teaching others through the understanding of Daniel chapter 9 verses, in this case 24 through 27. And 
It is very important that we understand that we are now speaking of the understanding of another man. We are speaking of things what many people appreciate when they buy a Bible, that they see notes of other men explaining to them what the Bible is all about, how they understand the Bible and how they explain the Bible to them. Which is a diversion, if you ask me, because it is the Holy Spirit who should lead every one of us into the truth by reading and studying the Word of God. We should not need, we should not depend on the explanation of another fallible, sinful man to explain the true Word of God to us. That is where many people get it wrong. That is why there are so many Bibles in the world today that you don't even know which one to get to get the true Word of God. That's why they are all falsified, because they are changed. They are changed by men. God put his word once and for all down when he inspired men with the Holy Spirit to write down what he had to tell mankind. And that is in the book, the Bible. But today we are going to study the comments of Matthew Henry concerning Daniel chapter 9 verses 24 through 27. At least we will start today because I think it is a PDF of some more than few, uh, some uh, a little bit more than 20 pages, so that's going to take some time. But we are doing that because we think it is important and we will measure everything to the Bible and to our understanding of Daniel chapter 9 verse 24 through 27 and to see if Matthew Henry is correct in his understanding and his explanation for his readers. And by this, I now welcome very warmly my brother Tom Fress from Inquisition Update. Yes, uh, thanks for, uh, for having me, Yerk. I'm very uh, pleased and blessed to be here and to uh, actually produce what we promised for the listeners in the last broadcast. Proof what the Protestant believers believed prior to the advent of futurism into the seminaries in England prior to the advent of futurism into the churches of the United States and around the world. They were not futurists. They were not futurists. And Matthew Henry was not a futurist. And we're going to prove it by his own mouth, by his own hand, in his own writing, what he believed. And what Matthew Henry believed and wrote about and taught about is exactly what the Protestant reformers all believed. They were unanimous in their belief. There was no such thing as futurism in their generation. They knew that Daniel's prophecy was fulfilled in history, that Jesus fulfilled it. There was no future fulfillment of the 70th week of Daniel. It never been heard of. And now we know that what they teach in the churches is a lie a damnable lie. It is designed to destroy true biblical Christianity, and it is taught in every church. Now, look, there's an exception to every rule, but I can't name you one church that doesn't preach futurism. Okay? So Satan has taken over the churches. They have confounded our understanding of Daniel's prophecy so that we believe a lie. And what we must believe if we're futurists is that the 70th week of Daniel is future. Whereas before the lie ever entered the churches, Christians believe because the Bible taught and history records, the New Testament records, the historical fulfillment of the 70th week of Daniel was the seven years before the gospel went to the Gentiles, and it begins at Jesus' baptism, halfway through his, his, his uh, crucifixion on the cross where he caused the sacrifices and oblations to cease and confirmed the covenant in his blood, the redemption of man. And then the Spirit-filled apostles continued to offer that covenant to the Jews and to Jerusalem for the remainder of the three and a half years remaining of the 70th week of Daniel, where they officially uh, uh, rejected the gospel, rejected the covenant that Jesus made with them, and stoned the deliverer of that covenant, Stephen, who testified before the Sanhedrin. And from that time on, 
as Yerk so famously says, the gospel went to the Gentiles. That's how you know the 70th week of Daniel is over, and he's absolutely correct about it. Now, we're going to deliver what we promised last broadcast. You're going to see with your own eyes, you're going to hear with your own ears what Matthew Henry believed before futurism began to be taught in the world. Listen carefully, mark it down, and change your mind to believe the truth. Forget futurism. Reject futurism. It's a damnable lie, and it has your soul as its target. We'll be back uh, and, and, uh, and prove this beyond any doubt. And you can confirm everything we say by simply reading the New Testament. That is the historical record. It's divinely inspired. It's infallible in its content. It can be implicitly trusted, and you will find in writing, in plain English, every jot and every tittle of Daniel's prophecy fulfilled by Messiah the Prince 2,000 years ago. Back to you, Yerk. Yeah, thank you very much, Tom, for your inaugural, in, inaugurative words. How do you say that? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm sometimes bad with my English words. You, anyway, you can you can twist your own tongue. Don't twist mine. <laughs> <laughs> with your inauguration of our reading today. So here you see uh, the beginning of the paper that is just copied from uh, ESOT because it is easier to read like this. And uh, there are some um, uh, some things added to it, and if I added something in the text, I put it in green color, so you know it is not in the original. That is what I gave in there. And, of course, when we have Bible quotes here, uh, they are most of the times in red, so that stands out. Here on the right hand, uh, or left hand, depends on how do you see it on the screen. For me, it's the right. For you, it's the left. On the screen, you see a picture of Matthew Henry, who lived in the 18th and... Uh, I think, if I'm not mistaken, 18th and 19th century, and who wrote a Bible commentary on the complete Old uh, Testament, as it is called, the, law, uh, the, the Laws and the Prophets. And uh, he partially did that for the New Testament, and then he died. And then uh, people afterwards took his notes and completed um, the complete comment of Matthew Henry even until the book of Revelation which he didn't comment on. They took that of his notes so that's not of him himself. But uh, the Old Testament he did completely for himself and this is what he wrote on Daniel chapter 9 verses 24 through 27. It's about the message itself. It was delivered with great solemnity, received no doubt with great attention and recorded with great exactness. But in it, as is usual in prophecies, there are things dark and hard to be understood. Daniel, who understood by the book of the prophet Jeremiah the expiration of the seventy years of the captivity, is now honorably employed to make known to the church another more glorious release, which that was, <coughs> which that was a, but a shadow of at the end of another seventy, not years, but weeks of years. He prayed over that prophecy and received this in answer to that prayer. He had prayed for his people and the holy city, that they might be released, that it might be rebuilt. But God answers him above what he was able to ask or think. Above, he means with the commentary he wrote earlier. God not only grants, but outdoes the desires of those that fear him. As we can read in Psalms 21, verse 4, quote, He asked life of thee, and thou gavest it him, even length of days, for ever and ever. Number 1. The times here determined are somewhat hard to be understood. In general, it is 70 weeks, that is, 70 times 7 years, which makes just 490 years. The great affairs that are yet to come concerning the people of Israel and the city of Jerusalem will lie within the compass of these years. These years are thus described by weeks, first in conformity to the prophetic style, which is for the most part abstruse and out of the common road of speaking that the things foretold might not lie too obvious. Second, 
to put an honor upon the division of time into weeks, which is made purely by the Sabbath day, and to signify that that should be perpetual. Now I think here we have a part of Matthew Henry's commentary that Tom would like to go a little bit deeper into for a little bit more explanation. To put an honor upon the division of time into weeks, and weeks are only made by the Sabbath day, purely by the Sabbath day. A week is made because that ends the sixth day of creation and then the seventh day in remembrance of it. And to signify that that should be perpetual. The Sabbath is perpetual. That is Matthew Henry's opinion. That is Matthew Henry's commentary. And when he says perpetual, well, you know, the perpetual mobility, or what was it called, Tom? We spoke about that yesterday, right? Um, yeah. uh, perpetual motion, it is called. What is perpetual? Perpetual Ever is never on, ending. Never ending, yeah. Ongoing forever. Mm -hmm. So, so much to the point uh, the Sabbath is over, right? Yeah. Any comment here, Tom? Yeah, no such thing as the Sabbath being over, and no such thing as the Sabbath being changed. The Sabbath is the Sabbath. And because we still make references to weeks in our seven-day calendar, that is a reference to the Sabbath. Were it not for the Sabbath that God established on the seventh day of creation, there would be no reference to either Sabbath or weeks today. But God uses the convention of, of weeks in the Bible, especially and particularly the prophecy that we're talking about, uh, uh, seven representing not merely seven days, but seven weeks of years. Okay? And so our seven, uh, seven years is one week in Bible prophecy. And so, uh, again, Matthew Henry wants to, wants to make the point without belaboring it, that the references to weeks in Daniel's prophecy is testimony to the fact that the Sabbath has never changed, nor has the reckoning of God of seven days making a week and seven years making a prophetic week. And it's all a direct and indirect, both and a direct and indirect reference to the Sabbath, which is perpetual. It will never end. Okay, and if it will never end, you must understand that it will never be changed. And we've talked about this before. I won't belabor the point now. I don't want to change the subject. But Matthew Henry mentions it, and I want the listeners to comprehend that he's making specific reference to weeks, which is written in Daniel's prophecy which inherently acknowledges God's creative power and his establishment on the seventh day of creation, a Sabbath. Back to you, Yerk. Yeah, I have a question to you, Tom. How does somebody who defends the theory of evolution explain the seven-day week? They can't. The and the 360 day circle. I mean, the 365 days they explain by the quote unquote uh, sun, uh, um, uh, sun system we are living in and all that stuff. But seven days, why seven days? Good question. It's a contradiction of their own belief. I, I never heard anyone giving me an explanation from the standpoint of evolutionism why a week has seven days? Why evolutionism? Why atheism? Why other religions in the world? They all make reference to seven-day periods as being a week. Why do the Chinese recognize a seven-day calendar? Why does any and every nation in the world recognize a seven-day week? They've all acknowledged the Creator by acknowledging a week, a seven-day period. Now they can preach atheism till the cows come home. They can preach, uh, they can preach uh, uh, evolution till the cows come home, but they can't explain why they observe a seven-day week. Well, I can explain it. So can God and all of His people. They're giving 
unwitting deference to the creator of all heaven and earth. Were it not for him and his creation of a seven-day period ending with the Sabbath, there would be no reference anywhere in the world of a seven-day period or a Sabbath. There would be no reference anywhere in the world of a week. Those words would have never been created. So the whole world, mostly unbeknownst to them, acknowledged the sovereign power of Almighty God to establish times and laws. So there you have it. Fools often contradict themselves, and you will find it a, a, a consistent, guaranteed characteristic of every liar. They contradict themselves. Back to you. Yeah, thank you for that explanation, Tom. Let's continue with Matthew Henry. With reference to the 70 years of the captivity, as they had been so long kept out of the possession of their own land, so, being now restored to it, they should seven times as long be kept in the possession of it. See also Matthew chapter 18, and this is verses 21 and 22, and this is a remark by me. Then came Peter to him and said, Lord, how oft shall my brother sin against me, and I forgive him? Till seven times? The interesting question is already, why does he ask seven times in the first place? But Jesus saith unto him, I say not unto thee until seven times, but until seventy times seven. Here, Jesus Christ, in his own words, tells his disciple and disciples, tells the world through, this is written and historically recorded in the Bible, that he is the fulfillment of Daniel's 70th week prophecy. I don't think, Tom, that we need any deeper into that. We've labored on that many a times. Certainly. But, but I'm just asking myself, how came Peter to him and asked him, why does he say seven times in the first place? This is all for our admonition. This is a witness to us. Peter was given of the Lord to ask this question. He was inspired by the Lord to ask this question so that it would be recorded in the New Testament that Jesus is the fulfillment of the 70th week of Daniel. Messiah the Prince prophesied by Daniel to come at this precise time, just seven years before the rejection of the gospel by the Jews and by Jerusalem and the going forth of the gospel then to the Gentiles who would receive it, Jesus is giving the last seven-year witness presenting the covenant that was made in the Garden of Eden, atonement for sin to the Jews and to Jerusalem. He's going to forgive his brethren, the Jews, not seven times, but 70 times seven times. That is the term that Daniel was given in his prophecy signifying precisely the calendar date that Christ would return. Seventy times, seven times from the going forth of the command to restore and rebuild Jerusalem to Messiah the Prince shall be seven weeks plus 62 weeks, which is 69 weeks altogether, and then one week. And this is the one week. It began at Jesus' baptism, and there would be seven more years uh, uh, determined for the Jews and Jerusalem to receive the gospel. And Jesus had come to forgive his brothers for seven times, seven more times. There had already been 69 times, right? Okay? So this is the last seven years of the prophecy, the last week of years of the prophecy. And they were going to be forgiven had they accepted Jesus' covenant of atonement in his blood. But they rejected it. 
and now the term is expired. The 70 times, seven times is over completely. And the gospel no longer resides with the Jews. Atonement no longer resides with the Jews. It has gone to the Gentile. Now, if the Jews want salvation, they want atonement, they've got to receive it from the Gentiles. The Gentiles are the only ones in the world that preach the gospel of Jesus Christ, the covenant in his blood. The Jews rejected it. The Gentiles received it with gladness. And it's by our Gentile hands and our Gentile mouths that they receive the forgiveness that God promised them if they would believe on his name. And so Jesus is confirming right here in the scripture that he is the 70th week of Daniel. Seven years are left of this prophecy, beginning when Jesus is baptism, three and a half years when he confirmed the covenant in his blood by actually becoming the Lamb of God, the sacrifice to end all sacrifices for all men for all time. And he did it when he said, it is finished. And immediately an earthquake, the rocks were rent, and the veil of the temple was ripped in twain from top to bottom and fell wide open to reveal the fact that the Ark of the Covenant wasn't even in there. There was no more need for animal sacrifices. The one and only sacrifice in all the world had been given for mankind. The only sacrifice that can take away sin. Take it or leave it. That's the message from that day on. And anybody who makes a sacrifice today is simply doing like the Jews, sowing the veil of the temple right back up and offering animals and goats and sheep and doves and pigeons and bullocks that can never take away sin. I don't care whether it's a Roman Catholic making the sacrifice of the mass or a Jew making an animal sacrifice in a rebuilt temple on Temple Mount in Jerusalem. God is not going to accept that sacrifice, and those who make that sacrifice eat and drink damnation to themselves, proving by their action that they reject the Lamb of God and the one-time all-sufficient sacrifice that Jesus made, Messiah the Prince, the Prince that shall come, who eventually, just like in the Babylonian captivity, used the Romans this time to destroy that temple, to raise it to the ground, not one stone remaining upon another. <clears throat> so no Jew could use it to make an animal sacrifice and eat and drink damnation to himself. It was an act of mercy that Jesus had that temple destroyed. An act of mercy did Jesus have that temple destroyed so that if they were no longer in a temple to make animal sacrifices, they might stand a better chance of accepting the Lamb of God from the mouth of a Gentile. Back to you, Yerk. Thank you very much, Tom, for this wonderful explanation of my question, why did Peter ask the question till seven times? I think that there is no other understanding even possible but to say that this was divinely inspired. Exactly. I personally don't I personally don't even think that Peter himself knew why he asked this seven times. Exactly. Because it's That's not the about question. the question, it's about the answer that is given. That is the most important part. And exactly. and to me, and this is a, a completely other subject to talk about. This is another proof of that there is no free will. That's right. How could Peter, out of free will, ask the question until seven times, just out of the blue, when there is a sense behind the seven times that Peter didn't even understand when he asked it? That right. is why he also, probably, at that time at least, did not understand the answer that Jesus Christ gave him when he said not until seven times, but until 70 times seven. Right, Tom? I, I, I'm convinced that, that, that if Peter were here alive to tell us today, he could neither tell you why he asked that question, nor what Jesus's answer meant. You might find that astounding, but I don't. 
God uses his vessels however he pleases. And he used Peter in this case to inform us all that Jesus was simply declaring his Messiahship. That's you know, what there's this a is. lot of people that say nowhere in the Gospels, nowhere in the New Testament, does Jesus outright say that he is the Christ. He says it exactly here. He says it right here. He says it right here. This is proof positive that Jesus is the Christ. When, he, when Peter asked him, how many times should I forgive my brother? Seven times? And Jesus said, no, 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 not seven times. Seventy times, seven times. And had Peter been full of the Holy Ghost, he, at that time, he would have recognized immediately that Jesus was making direct reference to Daniel's 70-week prophecy, and he would have discerned from Jesus' answer that Jesus was declaring himself as Messiah the Prince. But now, then, Peter didn't understand it. Peter didn't understand it. Neither did any of the apostles. This understanding didn't come to anybody till way later. And the Gentiles understand it. Why? Because they're full of the Holy Ghost. Okay? Those who have been submitted themselves to instruction from God, they understand that Jesus right here is declaring himself to be Messiah the Prince, the Prince that shall come that Daniel prophesied in Daniel chapter 9, verse 24 through 27. There's your proof that Jesus is the Messiah. Now listen, there's more to this. If you believe that the 70th week of Daniel is future and has not been fulfilled by Jesus 2,000 years ago, now you understand in this passage why I say you have denied that Messiah has come in the flesh. Do you see it now? When you say the 70th week of Daniel is yet future and has never been fulfilled, then you are denying that Messiah has come in the flesh. You cannot have it both ways. Jesus outrightly proclaimed that he was the Messiah when he said, I forgive my brethren 70 times, seven times. But then the gospel goes to the Gentiles. If they reject me after 490 years of this prophecy, at the end of that last week of years, my physical ministry in the world, then the gospel will go to the Gentiles. Maybe they will receive me. Jesus is outrightly, directly declaring himself to be Messiah the Prince, the Prince that shall come in Daniel's prophecy. And don't let another pastor or another priester tell you there's no place in the Scripture that Jesus outrightly declared himself to be Messiah. That is a lie straight from the pit. That you can expect a futurist to tell you because they will then turn around and tell you the 70th week of Daniel is future and there's a future Messiah to come. And I'm here to tell you, if they're not talking about Jesus. They're talking about the Antichrist, the papacy. Back to you, Yerk. Now, people, of course, could say everything that we said about here about Peter is just conjecture and our own opinion. But then I'm going to ask another question, or I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to, no, I'm not going to ask another question. I'm going to say something else. If Peter, at this time, speaking of the time in Matthew 18, when he spoke to Jesus Christ and asked this question, had the full and complete understanding that Jesus Christ was the Messiah announced in Daniel, not only in Daniel, but all through the Old Testament, would you then have denied him three times before the cock crows? I've got to ask another question that's just as legitimate as yours. It's a wonderful question. It's a wonderful question that you ask. If Peter and the apostles understood that Jesus was the Messiah that was going to take away the sin of the world, become a sacrifice, it says in Daniel's prophecy that he shall be cut off, but not for himself. Well, the Jews all knew what it meant to be cut off. He was going to die for their sins. Now, let me ask you this. Would any of the apostles, when the lawyers came to get him and take him prisoner to try him to eventually crucify him, would any of them draw on their sword to cut off the ear of the soldier? 
Would any of them try to prevent Messiah from going to the cross? The answer is clearly no. They might have led him to these sinners to be tried and to be convicted, but they didn't understand Daniel's prophecy. That's why they knew not the time of their visitation. Because not only did Daniel prophesy that Messiah would come, he precisely identified the time that he would come. And there was no mistaking that Jesus was the Messiah. The scriptures revealed what time he would come. Jesus' actions testified unerringly that he was Messiah the Prince. And yet, they tried to prevent him from going to the cross. You just Why? said something, you just said something they very profound, understand. Tom. They did not understand Daniel's prophecy, right. just like Christians don't understand it today. That is very profound that you say that. So all the people who don't understand the importance of Daniel 70 as we correctly to be understood, see themselves in good company. That's right. Even the disciples of Jesus Christ in the time didn't understand. That's right. They were betrayed as much as you, the viewer of this video, are, as much as you, Tom, were for a big part of your life, and as much as I was for a big time of my life. It is no problem to admit that you have been wrong. Even the followers, the direct followers of Jesus Christ have been wrong, didn't know what they were doing. Yep. The disciples, good that company. Hand, the disciples that were handpicked by Jesus did not understand that he was the Messiah and that he would be that he would die, but not for himself. And that he would be a sacrifice to end all sacrifices and that nothing in heaven or in earth would prevent him from fulfilling his divine role as Messiah, Savior, Prince, and King. Nothing was going to prevent him from going to the cross. He did it to save our lives. It was a mission of loving mercy that continues to save people's souls even today. And yet his own apostles, his own disciples, would have prevented him from going to the cross because they did not understand Daniel's prophecy. No more than they understand Daniel's prophecy this very day. Christians all over the world are ignorant of Daniel's prophecy. And you may look Till the cows come home. You may listen to every preacher in the world. You may never find another one that will tell you this truth. Jesus was professing when he said seven times, seven times, Jesus was, was positively identifying himself as Messiah in his messianic mission to present, to, to, to confirm the covenant that was made in the Garden of Eden with Adam and Eve, with, with Cain and Abel, a covenant in his blood. And he was going to do it for real this time. It wasn't going to be an animal that could not relate to our sin. It was going to be our own blessed Savior. It was going to take upon himself our sins and go willingly to the cross as a sheep led to the slaughter to buy our lives a, by ransom, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, the Lamb of God, Jesus, Messiah the Prince, that came in the beginning of the 70th week of Daniel's prophecy, continued for three and a half years until he became the sacrifice to end all sacrifices, and then continued in the spirit-filled apostles to present this covenant to the Jews and to Jerusalem until the remaining three and a half years when they stoned Stephen and the gospel went to the Gentiles. Anybody who tells you that any portion of the 70th week of Daniel's yet to be fulfilled in the future is a futurist liar. He's a deceiver. He's a damnable liar. And they all teach it. Every church in this country teaches it. You can't find a church that doesn't teach it. So what good are the churches? What good are the pastors? What good are the priesters? Satan is transformed into an angel of light, and therefore his ministers are transformed into ministers of righteousness. So your pastor is an emissary of Satan himself. How do you know? 
He preaches futurism, which is to deny that Jesus came in the flesh 2,000 years ago. That's what they do. They all do it. How do I know? We all believe it. Even me and Yerk were deceived by this, and I'm no longer deceived, and I'm never going to shut my mouth about this. And if you won't listen to me, God will raise up somebody else that you cannot ignore. Back to you, Yerk. With reference to the 70 years of the captivity, as they had been so long kept out of the possession of their own land, so, being now restored to it, they should seven times as long be kept in the possession of it. So much more does God delight in showing mercy than in punishing. The land had enjoyed its Sabbath, in a melancholy sense, 70 years, as we can read in Leviticus 26, verse 34, where the Bible says, quote, Then shall the land enjoy her Sabbaths, as long as it lieth desolate, and ye be in your enemy's land, even then shall the land rest and enjoy her Sabbath. Unquote. Okay, Geert, can I comment here? Oh, sure, Tom, listen, I want you listen, to. Listen, I have to emphasize this. We can't just breeze over this. This is this is this is a passage that is never correctly taught in the scripture in, in the churches. Okay? Jesus established the seventh day Sabbath on the seventh day of creation. It is a perpetual law and it is a perpetual feast of the Lord. Okay? To be in, to be uh, to be uh, obeyed by all men. Remember, that law was given before there was ever a Jew, before there was ever a Gentile, and yet God established it for all mankind. There isn't anyone who walks on two legs in this world and calls himself a man that is free from the law of the Sabbath. No one is free from the law of the Sabbath. Now, God also established a seven-day period for the land. Every seventh year, the ground was to lie fallow, no tilling of the ground. You ate what came up voluntarily, but you did not till the ground. That law has never been obeyed, ever, by anyone, including the Jews. And God brought them out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage, and he made a homeland for them in the land of Canaan. And when they got their promised land, they still forbid, the, 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 the law of God still forbid the tilling of the land on the seventh year, but the Jews never obeyed it. And they were, in, at the time of the Babylonian captivity, they had already missed the Sabbath for the land 70 times, seven times. They were 490 years in arrears. Or no, no, 70 years, 70 times they had, they, had, they had forsaken the Sabbath for the land. They had always tilled the ground. They had never let the land lie fallow. They had never let the land rest. And they were 70 years in arrears. And that's why, as recorded in Jeremiah, they were taken into Babylonian captivity for 70 years to make up all the Sabbaths for the land. And the land lie fallow because there was not a Jew there to till the land. It lay desolate for 70 years. God's law is going to be obeyed. That's final. That's the truth. Now ask yourself, and I don't mean to get off this subject, but ask yourself, who had the authority to change God's Sabbath or any aspect of his Sabbath? You find not one in this world that calls himself a Christian obeys either the Sabbath for the land or the Sabbath of rest. Not one who calls himself a Christian in this world observes either the Sabbath for the land or the day of rest. You heard it here first, and I will not repent of what I just said. But this is why we're all being punished. This is why we're all believing in futurism. We did not love the 
the truth. So God has deluded us with a lie that we all might be damned who love not the truth. Okay? There's a reason why we believe the futurist lie. It's because we love not the truth. And I'm beginning to talk about the truth that no one wants to talk about. This is what makes me a pariah in the Christian world. A, 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 an acknowledgement that I clearly accept without reservation. They can call me whatever they want. The Sabbath of the land still goes, and so does the seventh-day Sabbath of Almighty God. And all the Sabbaths of the land will be restored. Why? Because for a thousand years, there will be no man upon the earth to till the ground. And the earth, not just Jerusalem, not just Israel, but the whole world will enjoy her Sabbaths. So saith God in the scriptures, praise be to his holy name, his unchangeable name and his unchangeable law. Back to you, Yerk. On a little side note, Tom, if the Pope really was the substitute of God on earth, would this um, climate agenda not entail that the people should keep the Sabbath for the land. And if they did see that the land probably would be better than it is right now, I never hear the quote-unquote Pope, the Antichrist, speak of things like this. And the worst thing about this is that not one of the so-called Christians within the Catholic Church asks these questions. When they all read and love the Bible, as Christians should do, why is never anyone asking questions about the Sabbath that the land should keep and how the land would react? Because we are reading here in the book of Leviticus, but we also have the book of De Deuteronomy. And in Deuteronomy there are chapters where God says how the land will react when we don't treat it correctly. I think it is in I don't know, chapter 38 or something of, of, uh, uh, of the book of Deuteronomy. That's, that's a very interesting thing, a very interesting thought. Nobody in this world asks the question about the Sabbath for the land. Nobody asks if maybe there is a connection between us not keeping the Sabbath, the real true Sabbath, not keeping it for the land. And that's maybe a reason why we have this quote-unquote climate change <laughs> just i want to put this out there for people to even think about this and maybe to address some catholics with these questions so that they start thinking about it and saying yeah maybe you have a point maybe the pope is not the representative of god on this earth maybe there is no climate change but it is all godly ordained any thoughts on my thoughts here tom only the, to reiterate the same questions you ask. Why isn't this talked about in the churches? Because the truth isn't important in the churches. Believing the lie is important in the churches. Because if we study the scripture instead of what men think, we'd realize the Sabbath of the land has never been received, uh, rescinded. That God enforced the Sabbath for the land upon the Jews. Now, is he a respecter of persons? The Bible says he's not. So uh, what's in store for the Gentile world then? The, 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 the Gentile world who has received Christ. Listen, we're getting off on the Sabbath subject. Uh, I, I think maybe we ought to return to the, the intended subject of the broadcast, which is to prove that Christians prior to about 1805 had never heard of futurism. The concept that the 70th week of Daniel was yet to be fulfilled in the future had never been uttered in God's house. God's people knew nothing of it. What God's people knew was that the 70th week of Daniel was fulfilled by Jesus, Messiah the Prince, 2,000 years ago. 
That's what made him the Messiah. That's the reason why we read this comment of Matthew Henry, of course, and we will continue. I just had this question lying on my tongue and it needed to go out because when you ask things, you want to have an answer. Sure. And many people out there watching these videos are understanding what you said now. And yeah. that's why I put this question into their minds that they go out in the world and ask this question. Maybe they get an answer. Well, we, we answered the question when we asked the first question. If that's not confusing, I don't know what is. But look, we started out acknowledging that any reference to a week is acknowledgement of the Sabbath law, both for man and for the land. Any reference in any way, shape, or form about a week acknowledges the Creator and His Sabbath issued on the seventh day of creation. That's where we get the word week. And every seven year, a seven day period is a week ending with Sabbath, a day of rest. And likewise, every seven years is a day of rest for the land. That law still stands. Okay? Doesn't mean because it's not obeyed that it doesn't still stand. And anybody would be ridiculous to suggest that it doesn't stand when they read right from the Bible in the book of Jeremiah why God was, a, was, was establishing a 70-year captivity for the Jews because they didn't allow the land to lie fallow every seventh year. And because of that, they were 70 years in arrears. So God made it up. His law was not going to be thwarted. And I made the point at the end that God's law is not going to be thwarted even by the Gentiles. God's law still stands. The Sabbath law, law for the land still stands. And when Christ's judgment comes, and the earth is devoid of mankind to till the land, finally, the whole earth will enjoy her Sabbath. So saith God in the scriptures. This isn't Tom speaking. This is God Almighty. So saith God in the scriptures. And so anybody tells you all this cockamamie lunacy that's repeated over and over and over in the churches today about the Sabbath being changed to Sunday, about, well, Jesus is the Sabbath. Uh, we can, as long as we rest every seven days, we, we've, we're enjoying, you can have Sabbath any day you want. They're all liars, every stinking one of them, every stinking one of them. And whenever you hear one of these m morons, you should walk away, or better yet, run, before any of their lunacy gets on you. Okay? God's law does not change. I will not change a thing that goeth forth from my lips, the Bible plainly says. Jesus observed the seventh day Sabbath. He observed the same day that the Jews observed back then. Even though they didn't obey the law of the Sabbath for the land, they did obey the day of rest for man every seven days. And not only every seven days, but on the seventh day, at the end of the week, Jesus and the Jews, though they disagreed about a lot of things, there was no controversy between them about what day the Sabbath was. You can see what day they venerate even today. And is there any authorization in the scripture for Christians to do likewise? The first Christians were Sabbath observing Jews, and they never ceased to observe the Sabbath. Never ceased. And they still do today. That they observe the holy Sabbath of Almighty God. I end my case. I rest my case, and no one can gainsay it without making an absolute fool of themselves.
Back to you, Jörg. I looked it up, Tom. It is uh, Deuteronomy chapter 28. And in verse 15, it says, but it shall come to pass. Uh, first of all, it, sa it says in, uh, in the beginning, and it shall come to pass if thou shalt hearken diligently unto the voice of the Lord thy God to observe and do all his commandments, which I command thee these de this day, that the Lord thy God will set thee on high above all nations of the earth. And then it continues with all the blessings. And in verse 15, it says, but it shall come to pass, if thou wilt not hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God, who observed to do all his commandments and his statutes, which I command thee this day, that all these curses shall come upon thee and overtake thee. And then Deuteronomy 28 continues for a few pages until it ends in uh, verse 68. So read this. And with this, I'm going to end this discussion, of course, here, that I started here. But remember the question that I said, you should ask your pastor or you should ask a Catholic that you meet on the streets or wherever and ask him about the Sabbath of the land and the connection to the quote unquote climate change and then study the Bible in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 28. What, what you're directly inferring is that the curses of, of, of failing to observe the Sabbath for the land is what we're seeing today, but we're not calling it disobedience to God's law. We're calling it climate change. That's, that's, what you're inferring, that's kind of what I'm inferring, yeah. Yeah. So, so people are being directed away from the Bible and to receive the authority of mankind, that we're suffering climate change because there's too many people in the world, so we got to kill off a bunch of people, right? That's what they're inferring. But the Bible tells us if we don't observe the Sabbath for the land, all these curses will come upon us. Curses that we're suffering today. The earth will that revenge. That we're calling, that we're calling climate change. If there's anything that's causing climate change, it's because we don't obey God's law. Bravo. Back to you. Yeah. Thank you, Tom. <laughs> this was not planned, but I thought this was a wonderful and interesting little um, step aside we took from the subject. But now we're going to continue in Matthew Henry's commentary, of course. But now the people of the Lord shall, in a comfortable sense, enjoy their Sabbaths seven times seventy years, and in them seventy sabbatical years, which makes ten jubilees. Such proportions are there in the disposals of providence, that we might see and admire the wisdom of him who has determined the times before appointed. Number two. The difficulties that arise about these seventy weeks are, first, concerning the time when they commence, and whence they are to be reckoned. They are here dated from the going forth of the commandments to restore and to build Jerusalem, in Daniel chapter 9, verse 25. I should most incline to understand this of the Edict of Cyrus, mentioned in Ezra, chapter 1, verse 1, for by it the people were restored, and though express mention be not made there of the building of Jerusalem, yet that is supposed in the building of the temple and was foretold to be done by Cyrus in Isaiah chapter 44 verse 28, quote, that says of Cyrus, he is my shepherd and shall perform all my pleasure, even saying to Jerusalem, thou shalt be built and to the temple, thy foundation shall be laid. That was, both in prophecy and in history, the most famous decree for the building of Jerusalem. Nay, it should seem this going forth of the commandment, which may as well be meant of God's command concerning it as of Cyrus's, is the same with that going forth of the commandment mentioned in Daniel chapter 9, verse 23, at the beginning of thy supplications, the commandment came forth, which was at the beginning of Daniel's supplications. And it looks very graceful that the 70 weeks should begin immediately upon the expiration of the 70 years. And there's nothing to be objected against this, 
but that by this reckoning the Persian monarchy, from the taking of Babylon by Cyrus to Alexander's conquest of Darius, lasted but 130 years. Whereas, by the particular account given of the reigns of the Persian emperors, it is computed that it continued 230 years. So Thucydides, Xenophon and others reckon those who fix it to that first edict set aside these computations of the heathen historians as uncertain and not to be relied upon. But others, willing to reconcile them, begin the 490 years not at the Edict of Cyrus in Ezra chapter 1 verse 1 where it says, quote, Now in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, that the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled, the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, that he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom and put it also in writing, saying, and continues in the Bible, but at the second edict for the building of Jerusalem, issued out by Darius Nothus about 100 years after, mentioned in Ezra chapter 6. Others fix on the seventh year of Artaxerxes Memnon, who sent Ezra with a commission in Ezra chapter 7 verses 8 through 12, where we read, quote, And he came to Jerusalem in the fifth month, which was in the seventh year of the king. For upon the first day of the first month began he to go up from Babylon, and on the first day of the fifth month came he to Jerusalem according to the good hand of his God upon him. For Ezra had prepared his heart to seek the law of the Lord, and to do it, and to teach in Israel statutes and judgment. Now this is the copy of the letter that the king Artaxerxes gave unto Ezra the priest, the scribe even a scribe of the words of the commandments of the Lord and of his statutes to Israel. Remember what I just read in Deuteronomy. Yeah? Artaxerxes, king of kings, unto Ezra the priest, a scribe of the law of the God of heaven, perfect peace and at such a time. The learned Mr. Poole, in his Latin synopsis, has a vast and most elaborate collection of what has been said pro and con concerning the different beginnings of these weeks with which the learned may entertain themselves. Concerning the termination of them, and here likewise interpreters are not agreed. Some make them to end at the death of Christ and think the express words of his famous prophecy will warrant us to conclude that from this very hour when Gabriel spoke to Daniel at the time of the evening oblation to the hour when Christ died, which was toward evening too, it was exactly 490 years. And I am willing enough to be of that opinion. Me, Jörg, and I'm sure Tom, am not. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> I don't agree. No. <laughs> But others think, because it is said that in the midst of the week, that is, the last of the seventy weeks, he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease, they and three years and a half later, uh, after the death of Christ, when the Jews having rejected the gospel, the apostles uh, turned to the Gentiles. But those who make them to end precisely at the death of Christ read it thus, quote, He shall make strong the testament to the many, the last seven or the last week, yea, half that seven or half that week, namely, the latter half, the three years and a half which Christ spent in his public ministry, shall bring to an end sacrifice and oblation, unquote. Others make these 490 years to end with the destruction of Jerusalem, about 37 years after the death of Christ, eh? Con when we assume that Christ was crucified in 33 AD, 37 years later is 70 AD. This is what he talks about. Because these 70 weeks are said to be determined upon the people of the Jews and the holy city. And much is said here concerning the destruction of the city and the sanctuary. Three, concerning the division of them into seven weeks and 62 weeks and one week. And the reason of this is as hard to account for as anything else. 
and the first seven weeks, or 49 years, the temple and city were built. And in the last single week, Christ preached his gospel, by which the Jewish economy was taken down and the foundations were laid of the gospel city and temple, which were, uh, which were to be built upon the ruins of the former. Now, now wait a minute. You've just seen with, with, uh, with Matthew Henry's own hand that the belief was that the city and the, and, uh, the wall and the temple were built in the first seven weeks. First, there were seven weeks, then 62 weeks, and then one week. Yeah, I personally do and not that, agree that much with the city, Tom. I agree with the temple well, because well, there's I'll another pretty, yeah, there's I'll another pretty, part in the Bible where it says 46 the, years did we take to build the temple, right? Okay. The discussion is to determine when was the 70th week fulfilled yeah, yeah sure sure okay that's the point we're trying to make and i don't want to get muddled down the details because everything that you've read so far is just revealing the fact that the experts the doctors of divinity all <laughs> the historians they none agree with one another about how to reckon these 490 years when did they start and when did they end there's no agreement. And even we know that Satan so confounded the issue as to even change the reckoning of time from B.C. to A.D. Okay? It is most important to Satan's agenda that the world be confused and confounded about the beginning of the reckoning of this 490 years. When did it start? And when did it end? And, and Matthew Henry, if he's accomplished nothing here, he has convinced us unwaveringly that there's no agreement. Everyone is confused and confounded. Everyone has a different opinion. There are so many schools of thought as to the beginning of the 70th week of Daniel and the ending or the fulfillment of the 70th week of Daniel has to be impossible to sort it out. So that means we must look for another source of information rather than history. And where do we find it? In the infallible word of Almighty God, in the New Testament historical record of the perfect and complete fulfillment of every day of that 70th and final week. You can argue whatever way you want to argue. You can agree with Sir Robert Anderson and all the other fools who've tried to reckon the counting of the days from the going forth of the command to restore and rebuild Jerusalem to Messiah the Prince. You can argue, you can read their books, you can argue their positions till the cows come home, but you cannot deny the fact that the New Testament records every jot and every tittle of that prophecy being fulfilled in the most divine historical record you'll ever find in the New Testament. So, the answer is simple. None of the historians count. Don't let any of them confuse you. Just simply read the New Testament. You have to trust the Bible. It's God's word. And he said he would preserve his word, and that he did. The authorized King James Version of the Bible is proof positive that God preserved his word, and it is a perfect historical record of the perfect and complete fulfillment of the 70th week of Daniel by Messiah the Prince, who Daniel prophesied to come. The Prince that shall come fulfilled that prophecy 2,000 years ago, Nothing is left to be fulfilled by the Messiah. He fulfilled it all 2,000 years ago, and nothing is left to be fulfilled by someone else 2,000 years down, to his, down in history. Anybody who preaches that any portion of Daniel's prophecy was not fulfilled by Jesus Christ 2,000 years ago is a liar. 
anyone who says that any portion of that for, of that prophecy is to be fulfilled in the future is a liar. And anybody and anybody who says it's to be fulfilled by anyone but Jesus, Messiah the Prince, is a damnable liar. And the only thing you can conclude is the worst place in the world for you is in a Christian church because they all teach lies, damnable lies. And that's why Yerk and I are here. There's no other motivation for us to be here. There's no other motivation for us to take on the liars of the whole Christian world and to do it without fear and to do it without wavering. Every opportunity we're given and that is a courage that can come nowhere but by the hand of Almighty God. You cannot deny the historical record as recorded in the New Testament. You cannot find one detail of Daniel's prophecy. The 70 weeks of Daniel, not one word is left out in the New Testament. And not only that, it is witnessed once, it's witnessed twice, and many times, three times, proving every part of Daniel's prophecy perfectly and completely fulfilled by Messiah the Prince 2,000 years ago. Now, the only thing you can conclude at that part, at that point, is if anybody preaches otherwise, a future fulfillment, something fulfilled by an antichrist, he's a damnable liar. He is deceived. Why? Because he had not a love for the truth. What is the truth? Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, the Lamb of God, slain from the foundation of the world, who issued a covenant with mankind to redeem them from their sins. He issued it in the Garden of Eden. He confirmed it 4,000 4, years later on Mount or, or on, on, on Golgotha's Hill when he gave up his own life a ransom for us all and thereby put an end, a permanent end, of sacrifices and oblations. You continue to make sacrifices after that point, you've denied that Jesus was the, was the prince. You deny that Jesus was the Messiah. If you make another sacrifice, you deny that Jesus came in the flesh. You deny that the 70th week of Daniel was fulfilled by Jesus 2,000 years ago. You deny his precious blood, his precious redeeming blood. And you're off to the races to make your own salvation. And what does Rome present to you? The papacy, who it's always claimed to be the replacement of the Son of God on earth. That's what vicar of Christ means. That's the official title of the papacy. You can't get it wrong. They would never deny it. And so the future Savior of all mankind is going to be the Pope. If you reject the historical Savior 2,000 years ago and say that the 70th week of Daniel is future, you've prepared yourself to receive a false Messiah. And that's exactly what they intend to give you. That's exactly what they intend to give you. Every pastor behind every pulpit in this country and around the world, whether it's a Protestant church, an evangelical church, a Seventh-day Adventist church, a Catholic church, they all preach a future fulfillment of the 70th week of Daniel. And you know they're a liar. You walk in and ask the pastor, when is the seventh day, when was the seventh year, uh, 70th week of Daniel? And if they answer anything but Jesus fulfilled it 2,000 years ago, he's a damnable liar. And he will lead you to reject Jesus as your Savior your Savior, Messiah. He will cause you with your own lips to deny that Messiah has come in the flesh. And what does the Bible say? That is the spirit of Antichrist. And where do we get this notion? From the Antichrist himself, the Roman Catholic Church, the papacy. That's where it comes from. It's a creation. Futurism is a creation of the Roman Catholic Church. And why did they create this? Because Bible-believing Christians for the last four or 2,000 years have said what Paul said, that power that replaces the Caesars will be the man of sin, the son of perdition. And history leaves no one any room for doubt but that that power was the papacy. And so Christians for all this time have always and forever said the papacy is the Antichrist. Jesus is the Christ. The papacy is the Antichrist. And they had to be silenced. 
So the papacy came up with an alternative interpretation of Bible prophecy that puts the onus of Antichrist away from the papacy and either on to one of the ancient Roman Caesars like Nero or Caligula or puts it off to some unknown individual at the end of time. That's futurism. That's a papal creation to deceive the whole world and to shed the onus, the blame of Antichrist away from the Antichrist, the man of sin, the son of perdition in Rome, and put it on to somebody else. And that's what the whole Christian world believes. You cannot, people always ask me, Tom, what church should I go to? What church should I go to? If the churches are all wrong, what church should I go to? None. You are the church. And wherever the truth is told, the Spirit of God resides. Where two or three are gathered together in my name, there will I be in the midst. You don't need a building, and you certainly don't need a futurist priester to teach you. You have the Holy Spirit to teach you. You have the written Word of God. He will guide you and direct you into the written Word of God and bring you to all truth. You have no need that a man should teach you. Not even Tom Fress. Not even Yerk Glissman. You have the Spirit of God in you. He dwells in you. You have the authorized version, Christian, Bible-believing version of the Bible, infallible version of the Bible, the authorized King James Version. You have the truth. Let the Holy Spirit teach you. And I won't be needed anymore. And I can give my voice a rest. Yerk won't be needed anymore either. He could use a day off just like I could. It's up to you. You know why the world believes lies? Because they love not the truth. And what is the truth? God's law is eternal, immutable, undeniable, and it's eternal. No man can change it. No man can nullify it. Not one jot or tittle of it. It's eternal, immutable, and perfect law of God. The whole universe will obey his law. And you serve in a church that has denied his law and every tenet of it and has taught you nothing but lies. Why do you believe lies? Because you love not the truth. Now, don't succumb to the temptation to believe that I'm just on my little high horse preaching down to all the people. No, I believed every lie that you believed. I believed every single one of them. I'm guilty of all. But God granted me repentance. And I can't remain silent till the day I die. I cannot remain silent. Futurism is a damnable papal lie. It's straight from the pit, and it's preached from every pulpit and every church that calls itself Christian anywhere in the world. You have no reference. You have no, you have no refuge in anything called a church in this world. I'm sorry to disappoint. Back to you, Yerk. Amen, Tom. Amen. It's no coincidence that the official opening of the U.S. Embassy in Jerusalem came 70 years to the day after Israel proclaimed its independence. The country's founding 1948 document made no mention of God. Israel was established largely as a secular state. By contrast, today's U.S. Embassy opening was full of religious references, notably with an emphasis on evangelical Christianity. NPR's Tom Jelton reports. The invitation to give the opening prayer at the embassy opening in Jerusalem went to Robert Jeffress, pastor of the First Baptist Church in Dallas. There may be no Christian pastor more enthusiastic in his support for Donald Trump, and that came through in Jeffress' prayer to God. We thank you every day that you have given us a president who boldly stands on the right side of history 
but more importantly, stands on the right side of you, O oh God, when it comes to Israel. Though he was surrounded by Jewish religious leaders, Jeffress closed his prayer invoking his Christian faith. And we pray this in the name and the spirit of the Prince of Peace, Jesus our Lord. Amen. Jeffress is a fervent political supporter of Israel, though from a narrow Christian perspective. In 2010, he said that Judaism, along with Mormonism, Islam, and Hinduism, were religions, quote, that lead people to an eternity of separation from God in hell. Given such remarks, the choice of Jeffress to lead the prayer this day struck some as inappropriate. In a tweet, former presidential candidate Mitt Romney said, such a religious bigot should not be giving the prayer that opens the United States Embassy in Jerusalem. Asked about that tweet this morning on the Fox and Friends TV show, Jeffress said the things he's quoted as having said about Jews and others not going to heaven only reflect Christian teaching. Historic Christianity for 2,000 years has taught that salvation is through faith in Christ alone. And the fact that I and tens of millions of evangelical Christians still believe that is not bigoted and it's not newsworthy. A State Department official today defended the choice of Jeffress to pray at the embassy, saying Jerusalem is a holy city for millions of people around the world. We sought to reflect that in this event, the official said. Even among some who strongly supported the embassy move to Jerusalem, however, the Jeffress choice did not go over well. Rabbi David Sandmel directs interreligious engagement at the Anti-Defamation League. This is a moment where we should be trying to send out a message of hope, of peace, and of inclusion. And that's not the message that I think many people associate with Pastor Jeffress. The benediction today was given by another evangelical Christian pastor, John Hagee. He's long known for his support of Israel, but Hagee in the past has made comments critical of Catholicism. Republican Congressman Francis Rooney of Florida, a former U.S. ambassador to the Vatican, said in an interview on CNN that he'd have asked a radically different pair of religious leaders to speak at the embassy. I would have rather had a balanced scorecard. I would I would suit me to have as broad of an ecumenical list of speakers and participants as they could get. A White House spokesman today said the invitation to Pastor Jeffress reflected his strong relationship with many in the faith community. The Israeli government apparently had no objection. Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, speaking at the embassy, quoted the book of Zechariah, where God promises to return to Zion and dwell in the midst of Jerusalem. As it happens, Zechariah is a favorite of Christians whose support for Israel is based on a belief the Bible prophesizes that when Jesus Christ comes back to earth, it will be in Jerusalem.